Good morning, everyone. I'm Alison Van Dyke. I'm Executive Director of the Temple of Understanding. And I want to welcome you to the Eco Justice for All Dialogue series today, entitled The Food Crisis in Kenya is a World Crisis. This series is an ongoing program of the Temple of Understanding, a 63-year-old interfaith organization whose mission is to advocate for interfaith values in the secular setting of the United Nations as an NGO and around the world. Our focus for the past 12 years has been to increase the awareness of religious leaders and actors of our climate crisis and its negative impact on achieving the UN's sustainable development goals. In particular, those are peace, justice, women's health and safety, food sovereignty and environmental sustainability. <clears throat> it's my pleasure today to introduce our speakers to you. Patricia Combo is a passionate environmentalist, a founder of Patri Initiative, a land hero with the United Nations Convention to combat, conference, to combat des desertification and a youth climate envoy with the All African Conference of Churches. In 2021, she was chosen as the youth of the year in the environmental category as a healthy soil advocate and adaption scholar at the University of Nairobi. Besides championing a champion for climate change, she advocates for sustainable land use through the application of indigenous knowledge and practices with the aim of ending hunger, malnutri malnutrition, and poverty in rural areas and communities. Welcome, Patricia. Len Morris is the editorial director of Media Voices for Children, a documentary filmmaker, lecturer, and advocate for the children's human rights. In 2012, he was the recipient of the Iqbal Masih Award from the US Department of Labor for his extraordinary efforts to end the worst forms of child labor. Len's work has been shown at the U.S. Department of Labor, the World Bank, the U.S. State Department, USAID, the UN, and dozens of colleges across the country. He is the director producer of four child rights documentaries, Stolen Childhoods, Rescuing Emmanuel, The Same Heart, and The Children of Baal Ashram. Welcome, Len. Daniel Wanjama, is the coordinator of Seed Saver Network in Kenya. He is the coordinator and a steering committee member of the Global Open Source Seed System Initiative. He is also a council member of the Intercontinental Network of Organic Farmer Organizations. From his own words, Daniel says, I grew up in rural Kenya where everyone in the village was a small scale farmer. Childhood hunger triggered my interest to study agriculture later. <clears throat> I have close to 20 years experience providing advisory services to small scale farmers on seeds and agroecology. I founded the Seed Network in Kenya 10 years ago and my interaction with traditional seed keepers has made me a convert of seed systems management by farmers. I follow the Agikuyu tradition of spiritual practice. We believe a seed is life and life comes from God and that seeds should be commonly accessible to all and that no one should have exclusive rights over seeds. I consider the current practice of patenting seeds evil. Welcome, Daniel. Darcy Neal, board member of the Temple of Understanding is a native New Yorker. She's been involved in leadership training and team building for decades, alternating between the public and private sectors in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and North America. International assignments have included Peace Corps County Director in Morocco, Thailand, and Jordan, and much earlier in her career as Peace Corps volunteer in Gabon and Senegal. In recent years, her passion has been girls' education, environmental issues, and refugee settlement all with the next generation perspective. In her consulting practice, primary clients are international and intercultural organizations working to be their most effective in diverse markets 
Darcy is a member of the Board of Temple of Understanding and a UN representative to the Temple of Understanding's UN programs. <clears throat> Her primary involvement, however, is with the Temple of Understanding Youth Program, and she's indispensable help in that one. Welcome, welcome. The floor is yours, Darcy. Okay, thank you very much. It's so interesting to hear the range of experiences and backgrounds and generations and viewpoints. And our purpose today is really to get a piece of all of that because this food crisis, and we'll focus on Kenya today, extrapolates to many places. And I think it's important that we discuss that. So let's start out with, um, if I could hear from each of you, uh, how would you describe the current food crisis in Kenya from where you sit? your particular perspective, if we could get a snapshot. I'll call on you so we keep this flowing well. So uh, Daniel, would you like to address that first, kind of how it looks from your perspective and your experience? Yeah, thank you, thank you, that's it. Uh, to me, the food crisis that we are seeing today uh, is what Patricia has mentioned. She is uh, not able to go to work today uh, because there are riots, and these riots are associated with cost of living, which the major part of it is food. Food prices are too high. And um, the other way I have, I have experienced this, I, I mean, people are going to the streets because of food prices, cost of living, uh, which is a major part. Uh, but there is an, another angle to this. In the semi-arid areas of Kenya, parents are going to school every day, not because they are going to learn, but because they are going to eat there, where food is provided to their children. They are also going there to queue and have some food because there is no food at home. And the only place that food might be available is in the schools. Of course, this problem is huge and a lot of people are going without food and uh, our president estimate at 5 million people who need food aid in Kenya mm -hmm. and this problem is not going to end anytime soon uh, because rains are failing and the rains have just come but they are predicting that they are not going to last for long to me that is the crisis Great, thank you very much. So it's it sounds like it it may be ongoing. I didn't realize that that was there was that rioting going on outside that Patricia was was mentioning. Um, so Patricia, let why don't you jump in there and add what you're seeing these days in Kenya yeah. and a specific snapshot. Yeah, thank you very much. From my perspective and from where I come from, I can see the food crisis is broken beyond repair. It's very unsustainable and actually the future to us in terms of food crisis and food security is actually dark. Initially it was dim, but now it has gone to dark because everything is now strained. The farms, the, everything has really skyrocketed. And these are, this is because of so many factors that actually are less. And today, as you've heard Daniel say, the, the strikes are happening twice a week because people are demanding for, you know, for a better and affordable meal. People are, people are starving. And actually in some communities, children have stopped going to school because the farms are no longer productive and everything, everything that the community took proud of is now becoming a, a massive land that is not like very productive. And it has a lot of things. There is the issue to do with weather patterns, which are not predictable. And what is more painful and more shocking about our food systems and agriculture is that every weather event, be it when it rains, when it's dry, everything gets destroyed, perhaps because we lack policies and also because we lack early warning systems. When, like last week, if last week, but one, if you came to Kenya, millions and thousands of livestock. You'd find you would find find them lying dead because of starvation. Nothing was green. It has only rained for, it rained for less than four days, and now we are crying because the livestock, the remaining livestock, are dead because of flooding. Everything is you know everything is really shattered. 
So mm -hmm. it's a crisis that I'm saying has really shown us that we are actually entering into a deep pit that if we fail to collaborate and come together, we might not be able actually to come out. It. The situation is bad, it's unsustainable, it's dark, and it's painful when women, children, and people have to go for days without meals. Mm -hmm. We're gonna come back to some of those, those points in a little more depth, but I'd like to hear from Len too, from your years of, of, that you've spent in Kenya. Uh, what's your, your sense of or your view of the food crisis there, the current situation? Well, I would have to say that I certainly concur with what uh, um, uh, Daniel and Patricia just said, <clears throat> just said, had to say. Um, I'm I'm a journalist. I'm a photojournalist. I take film crews uh, all over the world, filming child labor and children's human rights. Children's human rights are defined as the right to food access to education, uh, gender equality, sanitation, health, um, basic safety, the ability to speak and participate and, and have a life, have a childhood. Uh, and, and that's the work that I've done all over the world and all over the United States. In November, I took a crew to five rural counties in Kenya and we filmed for three weeks. And um, it, I have to say it was appalling. It was the worst set of conditions I have ever witnessed in all of my years. I have worked in Kenya virtually in all of the country over 30 years. I run a program with a Kenyan-based organization called AMPCAN the African Network for the Prevention and Protection Against Child Abuse and Neglect. That's a great African acronym. We just call them the African Network or the network. Uh, they're my friends. I trust them. And the first time I ever visited a coffee plantation in, in, in 2000 or 1998 with a camera hidden and uh, discovered that 60% of the coffee was being picked by children, I was taken there by a social worker from AMCAN. I've worked with other organizations as well, but I mentioned the coffee experience because we enrolled children in school after filming them and seeing them covered in pesticides and working for a piece of sugar cane and starving and working 15 hours a day. We figured, well, we could, how much would it cost to put them in school? And the answer then was $50 a student. So, uh, so that was before elementary school was free, according to the government of Kenya. But um, so we enrolled them, and then we discovered that they did very well in school. And and from my home in Massachusetts, I realized that I had started a program. <laughs> it wasn't just a case of saying, "Hey, you're going to go to school for one term." So now it's thirty years later. And we are educating the children of the children. In fact, I, in November, met several of those students that we have put through school and whose families we have helped um, since we removed from, from work on that, on that plantation uh, 30 years ago. And so we have many friends and a special affection for Kenya. Uh, and we return to schools. So I wanted to speak to a point of yours, Daniel, about children going to school so that they can eat. Um, I went to 10 schools. Now, admittedly, it was only two weeks, but I went to 10 schools and I don't pick the schools. I don't pick the schools. I don't pick the students. AMPCAN does that. I trust my partners in Africa to do the work. I'm basically the representative, I do two things. I represent a donor community that raises money to enable uh, children to go to school and families to eat. And I take my camera, which is what I think my work is actually about, um, which is to photograph what I see and take what I photograph and put it in front of the powerful, the people who control money, the people who control budgets, the people who 
who, whose actions can make a material difference in the lives of those families, communities, and those children. And the other thing I'll say is I trust those communities. I trust them that you can transfer money to, the, to a mother and that she will spend that money on food for her children. I trust them. If you don't trust African people and African organizations, you have no business working there. That's just my opinion. Um, so at those schools, only one school, the national school, national secondary school, had a school lunch program. There were no school lunch programs in the schools. In, and I could, I could provide you with a list. I won't, but, but um, you know, uh, there, there simply were no school lunch programs of any kind. Quite the contrary. There were dry, there was a perfect storm of drought. The pandemic, I think the government of Ken Kenya was really flattened by the pandemic. The change in the government, I sense a willingness to do something, but a total lack of resources, frankly. A shift to a new county system of government. So we were working with county officials, many places where we went, but it was just hunger, 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 hunger. And wherever you have that, you have children involved in labor. If they can't go to school, they may as well go to the sugarcane field. They may as well go to the gravel quarry. They may as well go somewhere where they can make a few pennies to provide something for their family. Um, and the, the, the price increase that you mentioned, I bought a great deal of food food while I was in Kenya in November. I bought food and took it to schools and homes and orphanages and places where we went, again, that Ampken selected. And the food was incredibly expensive. I mean, just out of the reach, staple foods, out of the reach of normal households as our school fees. And then the last thing I'll say is, I noticed the almost complete and utter abdication of the responsibility of American and international aid agencies to address and treat and care for the well being of Kenya's children. And I would say the same is true for Africa's children in general. Um, with the, they're just, they're, they're not there. And I told them, I always tell them where I'm going. You know, I'm an American journalist. I can reach all of these various offices and they know when I'm in the country, where I'm going and, and why I'm there and what I'm doing. And you know, there isn't a single representative looking over my shoulder from the World Food Program uh, as a, for instance, on the topic of food. And I think that that's completely disgusting and it makes me ashamed actually. Um, uh, and so I'll, I'll stop. I don't wanna dominate the conversation, but my reaction to November was, that it was very terrible. And um, I went to Kenya with 39 students in our program. And when I came home by January and we had the figures back from the places where we filmed, we, we were now helping 793 children. So, and that's ridiculous. I run a tiny little nonprofit. This should be the work of, of the government, the work of of Save the Children, of the World Food Program, of USAID, of, of uh, in terms of gender, uh, you know, the Office of Trafficking at the Department of State. We have this these mechanisms set up. I believe the Biden administration means to do something. I've been here attending meetings. I can hear it. I see it begin to happen in the second year of his presidency but it's very, very difficult to do anything quickly. I think what, what is needed uh, is a Marshall Plan. I think what is needed is an immediate, an immediate response to children losing their childhoods and people dying and daily hardship. We have the capacity with a $20 trillion a year economy to do that. And I think that that's what we need to do. I think that that's, that's what yeah. I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Len. That, that really gives a perspective because we're looking at Kenya and we want to focus on the specifics, but it is not in isolation, right? There's a pattern, you know, there's a, a viewpoint or perspective. 
Uh, Daniel, um, as you see it in the day-to-day, -day, so Len has talked a little bit about, about the big picture. As you see the day-to-day -day crisis, how have you seen it um, change over the last few years? And it, particularly as you look at children, so it's always, right, that's what tugs at the heart and we go, oh my gosh, you know, but I know it, it affects adults as well. And if mom and dad aren't felt and nourished, they can't work. <clears throat> the kids. So, so what is your perspective on that um, real time on the ground right now in Kenya? Thank you. Yeah, um, as part of our work, we also organize uh, uh, fairs, especially seed fairs. And um, we do this uh, to show traditional varieties that are well adapted. And uh, on 8th, 8th of March, uh, actually this month, we have not, we are not yet in, in April. Nice. Uh, we organize a fair also to celebrate International Women Day. And uh, in one of the locations, which is Baringo, uh, during the fair, we normally also organize soup. So, and, and we, what we do, uh, we, we, we invite people like we invite people who are going to fit in the event. And this time we had invited uh, about 120 people, but because people realize that there is going to be soup, you know, we got over 400 people wow. attending the event and they had to share the soup that is available. And uh, this is a daily occurrence nowadays. You have people literally begging for food. Uh, people who are not previously fed, they could feed for themselves. They are now uh, going out begging for food, asking for food because they cannot, uh, they don't have food anymore. And, and children are even suffering even more. Uh, we have some, some reports that indicate that uh, uh, we have up to 30, 40% in some schools stunting like children. And this is not in the worst areas. We, this, the worst areas, children are malnourished nourished, and uh, they have problems with, uh, with, with, with the diet completely. But in the so-called almost normal area, about 30, 40 children percent of the children, they, 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 they are stunted. They, they, are, they, they, they are not tall enough for their, their weight is below their age and uh, children uh, going to school hungry. And uh, it, is, it, is, it is a huge problem. Uh, and um, what actually uh, surprised me and also maybe many people is, is um, the kind of interventions we are having, especially uh, from government. Of course, we, we now everybody is um, even contributing for people to be fed, other Kenyans to be fed. Ordinary Kenyans are contributing. Uh, people are asking for money and uh, uh, the companies that are here, people are contributing. But the part of the response that we have seen, the, 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 the previous administration was uh, subsidizing flour because a lot of people eat Uganda here. Uh, and then there was 100 uh, Kenya shillings, like less than a dollar, uh, two, two kilograms of, of unga. Oh, we call it uh, unga, it's, it's maize flour. Yeah. So, but whenever that flour mm -hmm. landed anywhere in the shop, uh, you, you, you saw people queuing in vegetary, a lot of people queuing and uh, people not being able to. To, to, to buy what they need because, because there is need and there is a, people are waiting, people are waiting for it. But the, that is one of the response. But the current administration response is subsidizing fertilizer uh, and uh, addressing the crisis, the food crisis by subsidizing fertilizer uh, I, I think this is part of the reason why we see people in the street today, because mm. people cannot wait 
for fertilizer uh, to, to, to boost production when they are already hungry. You cannot respond to such a crisis by just giving subsidy for input uh, and not even direct uh, funds to farmers, but you, you, you subsidize by fertilizer when the main reason actually had been the drought, the climate change, right. and all these changes uh, are clear to people, but the major impact is the drought. Of course, when it rained the other day, just uh, about 20 kilometers from where I'm seated, six people died of floods, even when it has not been raining for a long time. This is part of the crisis we are dealing with, uh, climate change and drought and, 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 and the floods when it rains. Uh, this is uh, part of the uh, crisis we are witnessing uh, all the time and uh, are coping in a way that people uh, can give advice to policies that need to be done is not, there is no forum. There is no forum for, especially the people who are living this life or that life to give uh, advice to, to the government so that the policies that are done could uh, accurately address the issues. Otherwise, we, we are not sure where is the government getting this kind of advice, like saying, because you have drought, what you need is fertilizer to do with that food crisis. <laughs> so, so to us, <laughs> that means maybe someone else who is selling fertilizer is the main advisor to the government in terms of food crisis. And that's why the solution to drought should be fertilizer. And, and briefly, I would want to mention that. Wow, wow. That's, that's really an interesting perspective. I'm curious, uh, Patricia, since you're in the city, since you're in Nairobi, and Daniel's viewing the countryside, what distinctions are, it's bursting out in the city, obviously, if there are riots and chaos today, but what are you seeing on the daily uh, scene in Nairobi in terms of the food crisis itself? Uh, thank you very much. In the city, I've been in the city for some time, but also from where I stay, it's at the center of the city and in the and the rural. So I have a both perspective. Mm -hmm. But in the city, because I go daily due to work, I've seen initially you would see what we would call like the small scale traders. You would find them selling fresh products at affordable prices. Initially, the, you with less than one dollar, you would purchase a shopping that would cost to a family for three days, fresh vegetables and everything fresh. But currently, even with $100, you're not able to sustain your household because everything has skyrocketed. Everything is extremely high, Ex uh, like vegetables and fruits. Currently, people are terming them as luxury because you would not rather spend a lot of money on vegetables and fruits because the prices is very high. And initially, the food, products that were sold on our streets majority of them used to come from our local farms but today when i'm interacting with the traders they will tell you these tomatoes are from our neighboring countries these eggs are imported from this and that these and these and now the question comes what is happening to our local producers what is now the what is now entering them from you know selling because if they have to import from a neighboring country it means they have to increase the price so as to ensure they they cater for the transport and all these issues so there's a disconnect between our locally produced you know our locally produced food which i think is actually one of the causes why we are having uh, having you know the skyrocketing prices and again i believe because i've worked in the rural setups i believe we have one of the best lands or rather one of the best soils to produce some of these vegetables. But because of the disconnect between the national government, the policies and the implementation, we, we tend to lose a lot of food. Secondly, another thing, big thing that I have witnessed because we have uh, what we call the common open markets. I was in US and I've, I've known the difference between the markets in the in other countries and the market we have. If you go, there is a one big market in the town called Mudura, where this is where I buy 
all lorries ferrying vegetables come to, to unpack. They sell to traders. Now the traders, they sell to suppliers, and now they sell to traders. Every day you'll find, I can say a third of the produce loitered on the ground, which have gone to waste. Tomatoes which are pressed, cabbages which are broken. So we are also losing a lot on, on the value chain due to food, you know, food loss, food. You know, it gets lost along the chain from between the farmer to the market and now to the consumer. So if this chain leads to breakages for the supplier or rather for the seller, we try to incorporate these damages and it reflects to the final consumer. And also due to lack of the mechanisms on how the food is stored. You know, a lot of these food are perishable. Like initially in my community is during mango season. And I'm telling you, if I share photos that I took from several farms, thousands of mangoes have fallen down and they are rotten because we do not have, as a country, we have not incorporated measures to ensure the shelf life of some of these products. And because of this getting low, going bad, you know, it, if you calculate the value chain and everything and also waste of resources, it translates to high cost of living. And another thing that I've witnessed with our markets, initially within the, in the next government, GMO was banned in the country. It was like illegal. But with the current government, once they resumed power, the first major things that they did was introduction of GMO. And with introduction of GMO, there is a current, it's a court, it's a battle of between court case and whereby I know Daniel will talk about it because it, it entails seeds. There's the seed cap laws, whereby farmers, indigenous farmers, are not allowed to share indigenous seeds. And now we are talking about, you know, supremacy, whereby you have sovereignty of seeds, whereby some of these indigenous seeds that are drought tolerant. Because for the four time, we've now experienced drought for the four consecutive, you know, seasons. And some of these indigenous seeds, actually, which now the government terms illegal to share among, among farmers, which is a practice that our forefathers, our grandparents used to share, actually, it's like, a, like you know, it's like, you know, you are staining the farmers because now they have to go to buy seeds from corporates. They have to buy seeds. And some of these seeds actually are prone to pests. Because one of the challenges that we find, we'll go, you'll go, you buy a seed, you'll plant. After it reaches a certain maturity, you'll notice some either disease or pest. You'll now have to go back to buy pesticides, herbicides, and all this. So it becomes expensive for a farmer when they are doing this farming. And the, the, the end product that you will get, because after calculating the, the purchase of seeds, purchase of fertilizers, purchase of this and pesticides, herbicides, they will have to skyrocket the prices to cater for the, you know, for the expense that they incurred. So I feel even along the value chain, it is disconnected. And all these with disconnected, with high price, the burden now goes to consumers. And at the end, it goes back to children because as we, as you know, I work with a children-led initiative, the party initiative, we work with kids. And every day you're getting stories of children telling you, we've only survived on porridge, not taken and you know you attend class and children are just looking at the teachers and again the the food program the feeding program is not from where i come from there is no school that has enrolled there or rather is being supported on the food program i'll be honest it's my country is my you know is my nation but the food program it's only on i could say selected region but people fail to understand that even in other regions where this food feeding program has not been rolled out. Actually, children people are really suffering. So if the feeding program would be you know, rolled out in all schools, it would actually ensure the issue of fairness because even in the communities or rather even in the regions, which we said they were agricultural, like the basket, the agriculture was doing well. Actually now because of weather patterns, the productivity has gone down. So when I look at the food crisis in general, both in the cities, both in the rural sector, I feel we've not actually joined the dot. Every sector, everyone is working on their own. And that's why you find along the value chain, a lot of things are happening. At the end, because it's broken from 
from engagement from the policy farmers, teachers, knowledge, community awareness. Every sector is broken, and that's why you find today property people are demonstrating because you will not give me fertilizer after I've experienced drought, and you expect that fertilizer. Actually, the fertilizer will cause more harm because the weather patterns they have said it will only rain for a short period. If I apply fertilizer today and it fails to rain tomorrow, actually what I have planted actually will be scorched and it will end. So we need uh, the system to be complete and it cannot be complete by only one sector. We all need to come together and just walk the journey together to ensure production, consumption and everything actually is well integrated. Thank you. Patricia, I think that's that's important. And I know that the seed part is something that Daniel's focus on the Seed Savers Network, the inability or the lack of permission to trade seeds and honor those systems that worked for so long, right? Isn't that part of the Seed Savers Network, Daniel? Sure, uh, that is uh, what we, we do as Seed Savers Network. Uh, we, we, we believe use of uh, local seeds and uh, seed sovereignty is an important intervention for food security. And uh, I, I, I hope I can get an opportunity to comment on that too. Yes, please go ahead, right, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so so we, we promote uh, use of uh, local varieties and uh, because of what Patricia has mentioned, um, we, we have a situation where uh, it is illegal for, for you as a neighbor or, or for me as, a, as, as to give my neighbor seeds, which is ridiculous because this is what we have done. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, our uh, four mothers and fathers <laughs> have been doing this <laughs> since they, they were, and now it is illegal. You you cannot give uh, another person seeds uh, even for free, uh, but you can also uh, not exchange, and you cannot even uh, sell, and you cannot even share uh, because uh, because that in law, uh, seed and plant varieties act is defined as selling and selling of seeds that are not certified is illegal. So they hide sharing and exchange and all that by defining it as, they, they, they criminalize sharing and exchange by defining it as selling so that seeds don't move. And the only seed that should move are seed from what nationals. And to make the matter worse, uh, the Seed and Plant Varieties Act allow the private sector to privatize farmers' varieties so that if farmers' varieties are criminalized, uh, are, are registered by private sector, then it is not uh, allowed for you to save your own seeds. For instance, if I'm growing today a certain variety of beans, and then a certain company get interested in that particular variety, they'll just pick it and apply for registration and then they'll go and own it. And the only uh, requirement for, from authorities for them is to show that those seeds uh, or that variety has not been registered before. If it has not been registered before by anybody else, then they can own it. And once they own it, I have no right as a farmer to save the seeds from the previous harvest and use it again. If I do that, from that uh, moment, I'm supposed to, to, to buy seeds now from the, from the company that uh, registered my own seeds, which was previously mine. And because of those challenges, uh, as a network, we have uh, together with the farmers gone to court to challenge uh, those provisions of the act and, 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 and um, seek interpretation from the court on uh, whether farmers should have their own right or uh, whether the, 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 the Seed and Plant Varieties Act should have its way because uh, to us, the provisions, some of those provisions in, those, in that act are illegal in the sense that they deny farmers right to own their own traditional varieties and also deny farmers right to, to continue with their traditional 
practices like seed selling, seed selling, uh, which which are protected by the constitution. And uh, other than that, as a network, what we do is we create awareness on these issues and on the value of uh, traditional varieties and uh, why we should conserve them. And uh, people, why, why sh should people use them, utilize them so that they don't disappear because what is, what is used will not disappear and uh, what is not utilized uh, might uh, go to extinct. And we also uh, collect uh, farmers' indigenous knowledge on the way they conserve and use these varieties and uh, use that knowledge also to spread to other farmers. As a network, we, 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 we are, we are uh, in, in great partnership with the farmers who understand how to do this and who understand the value of these varieties. And they are part of the campaign network to go tell others, this is the way we do it. And uh, this is the way uh, it, it has always been done. But other than that, we also do advocacy to, to ask uh, the, the, the authorities as a government to make policies that are favorable to uh, conservation of local varieties, to food sovereignty, and uh, to help people uh, have, uh, have their rights to food, to produce their own food and eat it. And, and, and of course, uh, we, we make uh, some progress because we have seen so many people now join our network. Now our network is now, like now 66,000 uh, members. And a lot of those members work from the heart. They are mm -hmm. volunteers and they go in the villages and uh, they use every forum include including the, the the church forums to tell people that this is this is uh, wrong especially on the issue of nutritional security on the issue of food safety we work with everyone for instance we also um, want uh, just to mention this yeah. uh, we we have invited uh, church leaders uh, to yeah. educate church leaders on the issue of food safety because uh, we, they, they, there are some survey in Kenya that indicate 90% of vegetables, fruits, fresh produce are intoxicated with the pesticide uh, to levels that they are not suitable for human consumption. And because authorities are not taking action on that, perhaps because of the lobby from uh, corporates that sell these chemicals, the authorities are not taking action. Maybe action from the grassroots might help and creating awareness and educating people through the church is a, seems a much more practical way to go because uh, people are able to, to listen to, to their that's, uh, spiritual that's leaders. That's already a congregation, right? They're already a community and yes. they're used to acting together. So you're taking advantage you know, of another network. I wanted to, you've mentioned awareness a couple of times, Daniel, uh, and we're focusing on Kenya. But are you in touch with, or Patricia, you've been in the States and had some exposure through the UN. How does this relate, or how could we apply what's happening in Kenya to neighboring countries? You talked about neighboring countries, but, but is there any unification? Is there any way uh, that you see this particular crisis related to the world crisis? Anybody, what's your sense of that? Are you are you seeing that awareness at least? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Patricia. <laughs> Sorry, I'm supposed <laughs> to be the moderator. I should be managing this. Sorry, Patricia. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And looking at the crisis, is not only affecting Kenya. I was in US for a month, and I was able to see the changes and also learning from communities. I visited four states. And one of my key concerns to learn was on food, the food prices, food prices and everything. And I happened to visit the University of Florida, uh, the department that does with, deals with agriculture. And just from learning, I realized actually even what we think other countries are not going, actually they are in bigger and you know crazier crisis than what we're experiencing. Like in Florida, in the, in the department, Department that does research, agriculture, and everything. They were telling us the biggest problem of the biggest problem as actually the food crisis 
is because of weather patterns, because of the warmer temperatures, and some varieties of avocados and uh, of middle was avocados and vegetables have actually gone extinct. And just trying to learn from that, everyone and everyone have actually like tried to to learn. They have actually said the issues to do with Russia Ukraine war because they told me some of the imports actually used to come from Russia, you know, fertilizers and and the war has actually, you know, turned around everything that they relied. Now they have been able, now they are forced to look for other options. Now coming to my country, Kenya, wheat, which is the biggest or rather the largest consumption product, we import it from Ukraine. And now since the war began, even vegetable or vegetable oil, the cooking oil, since due to the interference with war, some of these supplies have actually, you know, the supplies have gone down and it, affect, it affects every chain. Mm -hmm. So you find a lot of things have, are not going the way they are supposed to go. Now, mm -hmm. currently, we are using some of cooking oil from our neighboring country, Tanzania. And, you know, because of these dynamics and this inflation other countries are going, everything has really been broken. So I feel also, it's beyond, sometimes we have the power to control, but again, it goes beyond the normal, it goes beyond our normal chains, because for the countries that relied heavily on Russia or rather or Ukraine, and with this civil unrest, things will have to stop. Even currently in Africa, like in last week, five countries in Africa were holding demonstrations. What does this demonstration translate in the entire food crisis? People were saying, applying people are selling a lot of destruction happens so it breaks everything with civil unrest you know in fluctuation the dollar rates going you know crazy things have actually gone you know to the north for us maize initially we were doing maize from mexico the other day higher the government we are trying to explore other countries where we can get made so the supplement and the entire chain has been affected by international forces and every country currently is facing climate crisis. So every country, when you try to, to have these trade deals on, on food and service and production, every country says, you know, we are also experiencing crisis and it will be unfair for us to supply you with food when our people are not, are not you know, are not well catered for. And also the issue to do with uh, electricity in Africa. Electricity is actually one of the key drivers of, everything that we see. And I'll use a, an example with Kenya. We rely heavily on electricity for everything, electricity and power. And the other day, the government, due to inflation or rather, I'm not, I'm not in a position to say the causes, the power utility bills have gone high. What does this translate to the people or rather the farmers who are doing large scale mechanization, people have to use electricity to pump water, everything becomes broken. So at the end, the, some farmers will be forced out of the, of the production or rather some production because of high production cost, everything now changes. So it needs a multi-level you know, connectivity for people now to, to streamline this. And now we also have to look at the changing dynamics of weather patterns. Our weather patterns are not the same. And for any policy, anything that we have to look, we have to put in our key factor is climate crisis. What happens when this climate crisis goes to us? How will our people be fed? What happens when these countries who have been supplying us with this are in a position they are not able to, to supply? What is our resilience plan for our communities? Because I am so happy when I see international organizations supporting us. But my question is, for how long are they going to support us? Because currently it's not only climate crisis that we are facing. We have triple planetary crisis, we have civil unrest, we have inflation in every country. What happens when these countries are not in a position to help countries to, you know, to be on their feet when it comes to food crisis? So we also need to look beyond the crisis that other nations are facing and build a resilience plan to ensure our communities, no matter what climate crisis, no matter the drought situation, no matter how floods come and destroy, people will be fed. The commodities will be 
you know, will be resilient. And another day I was having a conversation and I was looking, a friend was telling me of how Egypt, you know, Egypt, Israel, these are countries with, I can say they are arid, <laughs> but they are able to produce food. They are able to, you know, to tap, to store water and to do all this. Coming to our country, we can borrow some of these techniques to ensure we can actually make, put our land under irrigation. When it rains, water goes into us. Oh, thank you. Right. Patricia, I just, there is so much here. I wish we had, you know, hours or we were, as I said, going to the back and having a cup of coffee, but I want to pay attention to the time. And I want to ask if, if there are some people in the audience who have questions, give them a chance to put that in the chat box so we can get a really focused. And Daniel, I wanted to give you a, a minute there to talk about beyond Kenya, right? In the awareness and the collaboration, are you seeing anything? Are there efforts or anything that you're undertaking uh, that goes beyond? I know the focus has to be local. It has to start there. But I just wondered if you have any experience beyond Kenya, beyond the region. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, I think beyond Kenya, uh, as Africa, uh, there is a feeling that we are experiencing the same situation. Uh, for instance, uh, I have invitation for a meeting in South Africa in June to discuss uh, how seed laws are being harmonized uh, across the continent. I, I've, I've uh, taken this because it has started raining here. I hope that noise oh, from, <laughs> from there. That's a good noise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that noise does not uh, interfere with, <laughs> with uh, no. our communication here. Yeah. yeah, so uh, because uh, especially uh, at policy level is it's all global and it's all regional. And for instance, uh, what to me part of the problem is the green revolution kind of policies in agriculture where what we promote is monoculture, uh, which is uh, like everybody should do farming as a business, even when we are talking about less than one acre of land uh, and government promoting that. But that is not just the government, but a push from institutions such as World Bank, IMF, uh, pushing policies uh, that somehow they, 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 are, they worsen the crisis where uh, every small farmer need to, to depend on fertilizer, a hybrid seeds or GMO seeds. And uh, they also need to depend on the shop all the time buying things. And then uh, using one crop uh, like monoculture. And that means uh, in case of failure, we fail completely. And again, uh, part of the other policies is a situation where our food security is built around a crop, maize. And uh, if you don't have maize, then you have no food. Uh, other than a situation that we used to have in the traditional days where every community grew what agreed with their environment. For instance, if we had communities in uh, dry areas, they used to grow sorghum millet and they used to eat these. Uh, other communities in other places eating cassava, uh, they used to grow it and they, they, they were growing what could agree with the environment. And of course, a combination with so many other uh, crops, uh, including fruits, including vegetables, people growing diversity for resilience and having uh, a situation where if something fell, this one will survive. And There's this something is- to back it up to compensate. Exactly, and and but the policies that were adopted uh, by the government, I don't believe uh, they, they they are local. I believe they were also international because these policies I hear they did the same uh, case to India, India uh, where farmers now started committing suicide because it is too expensive. They are not able to pay the loans that they took uh, to fund. They are farming, retro farming. A lot of farmers committing suicide. We have similar situations 
in other countries, uh, Southern Africa, everywhere, uh, making farming very expensive and uh, having uh, food production uh, too expensive in the assumption that if we produce excess food by one person, communities might be able to buy food from others. And this is not possible. This is not possible for situations such as Kenya, because if someone, a lot of small scale farmers, they have no alternative livelihood. If they cannot grow their own food, even if the food is sold at a throwaway price, they cannot afford it because they have no any other income. Right. And right. The, the only solution is they should be allowed to grow their own food and eat it. To grow their own food, it cannot on the on the perspective of green revolution, monoculture, it must be on diversity and growing what they, they, they or everything that they need to eat. Right. And and uh, and I think in terms of policy, the global policy, the WTO is 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 part of the problem here. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm listening, I was listening to what Len was talking about, about the policy and the, the level of people that he's talking to. I'm drawing on my own experience in West Africa in the 60s and the traditional, you know, growing what worked and if something failed, there was an alternative. And this is, this is something that has devolved. Um, and I just, I just, given all of this, you talked about awareness and, and I think awareness precedes meaningful choice, right? So it's one thing for me to know that, right? So for instance, we were talking about having a cup of coffee and then Len mentioned, you know, the Ken the coffee farmers and the child's labor. And I thought, I never think about that when I, I think Kenyan coffee is delicious, but I think that, that that's one of the reasons that we have these sessions is that we begin to look at, right? How are they interacted? What what was I not aware of so that I make bit different, better, more informed choices? But, but you also said something, Patricia, where you said the prospects have gone from dim to dark. So as, as youth and as you look forward, given all that, where each of you, where do you find your hope or your inspiration? because it does sound so serious and so pervasive, and yet you keep going. You have your program, you see that smile, you see a change in a farmer's behavior. Where is it that you draw your inspiration or motivation? Let me give Len a chance, because we've been, he's been nodding, <laughs> had a chance in the beginning. But Len, where is it for you that it's worth going on and trying a new combination or trying a new venue or whatever? Well, it would be without question in the faces of the children, <laughs> the faces of a, uh, when I came back from Kenya in December, I was very disturbed, more disturbed, more upset and affected personally than I've been on all these trips. And I've been all over India. And I recognize in what you say, Daniel, the war against um, basically the way of life in rural economies. It's so remarkable to me that policies would wage war against simple concepts like sharing and using uh, seed varieties that are already proven to be successful in areas. But we know that greed and commerce uh, uh, sit atop all of this on a macro level. And, uh, um, but, um, you know, filming girls working in a sand mine who are 10 years old, eight years old in a very dangerous setting and bringing that image back. And then just three days ago, getting a picture of them all in their school uniforms with their bags at their first day of school is uh, something that gives me a lot of hope. Um, but, but bringing this all back to right now, I think that schools are the key to, uh, and school lunch programs and community lunch programs like the fair that you described, Daniel, I think that you know collective action 
Uh, Kenyan people are hardworking people, resilient people. They want their children to go to school. Usually uh, uh, school children, in, usually the enrollment figure in Kenya is 95, 96% for school. Um, now with the pandemic and the Ukraine uh, it, and the drought, it's just kind of a horrible, perfect storm for children. And I think that if we had school lunch programs, people would come to school, students would come to school. They would also be able to take food home to single parent households. There are millions of orphans from HIV and other diseases in Kenya. And if you have a child in school, you can also provide them some medical treatment, some basic uh, Im, you know, uh, immunizations, and that does not happen. I haven't seen, you know, you don't go to the nurse when you're sick in a Kenyan school, at least not any of the ones that I have visited. Um, so I think that, you know, there's an awful lot that can be done through schools and through churches. And I think it's the responsibility of the World Food Program to do that. That is the agency that feeds young people and adults in 129 countries actually it's probably more than that and this week i noticed that usaid has announced a new emergency program with the world food program to get highly nutritional food to places where it's needed and i certainly hope that africa would be included on that list and kenya in particular that's what's needed last year last year the World Food Program delivered 550,000 meals in Kenya, in a country of over 50 million people. Now that, that is wrong. And, you know, this is, this is something that hasn't been said, but it should be said. I think in the time of the pandemic, the wealth of the G20 economies has increased tenfold. In the time of the pandemic, when we promised and pledged to share vaccines equally with Africa, fewer than 3% of Africans are actually vaccinated against COVID. We've broken every promise, and we've also broken all of our pledges, which we share equally with the government of Kenya, who has signed all of the UN resolutions, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the, the sustainable development goals, these have all been violated. In fact, in the last five years, more children have died in Africa from preventable disease and hunger than at any time since the sustainable development goals were introduced. And I have to tell you, I think it's race. If you don't believe that racism isn't associated with it, then you're, I mean, you're entitled to what you think. But why is it that Africa is literally a forgotten continent when it comes to this kind of activity? So I would move, and I think it's very important for people uh, like Patricia and Daniel to, to take their message outside right. of Kenya, especially since you're hitting the wall against your own government. You need to, you need to increase the pressure. You need to increase the noise. I'd be happy to give you any of the footage that I've shot if you can make use of it. I would be delighted to work with either of you because I think- And I think that's, that's a great place for us to wrap this up because even this network right here, right? Each one reaching one and making a difference is, is exactly where the hope comes from. And um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Patricia, I love seeing the next generation and your enthusiasm and how you see every one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, which is exactly what we all need to have. And Daniel, it is wonderful to see you again and to know that, there are, that you're handling those long lines of people that are there for the soup. So thank you for that. Thank you for your, for your effort. Allison, I know we're out of time. I wish we had more, but mm -hmm. uh, would you like to say a few words? I think this has been absolutely fascinating. And I just want to thank all of you, Darcy, including you, for a, a, a really pithy, good, incredibly wonderful discussion. And I, and I think one of the wonderful things that might come out of this, Len, is some kind of coordination with, with uh, Patricia and Daniel, because 
yeah, this message has to get out. I mean, we're tiny. You all are tiny. I mean, we are just, you know, we've got to get the message out there. So thank you. Thank you so much. Also, thank everyone who has supported us financially to keep this important program going. And I just want to mention that our next program is entitled Resilient Communities Through Agriculture. And we have a moderator who's a filmmaker, Costa Budakaris, who, who made the film Inha Inhabit, which is a permaculture perspective. And we also have wonderful speakers, Jane Henderson, founder of Transgenital Farm in New York, Laura Lendick, Lendick a soil scientist, and Karen Washington, a founder of Rise and Roots Farm in New York. So please join us, keep an eye out for the e-blast from the Temple of Understanding. And we will see you hopefully in, in April. I, I don't remember the date exactly, but the e -blast, it'll be in the e-blast, probably the 28th or so. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you, Daniel. You. Nice to meet you, Patricia. Nice, nice to see you, you Len. Thank New you. York next thank time. You. Thank you. I learned a great deal from both of you. Thank you. Bye.